pa pa pa. Wa pa pa pa. Hello, hello. Hi everybody. Hello. New way. MTTR7 RNA. It's Veru. Nice to meet you. Van Zalden. Kona. Hello. Waterfall. Hi waterfall. Oh, it's nice to meet you too, Veru. I'm glad you're excited and Today really is a good day to be excited because it's time for the Host in the Shell podcast again. My favorite time of the month, to be honest. As many of you um, might not know, my name's Digi Shell. I'm a Tamagotchi VTuber and I just love inviting different creatives and just asking what they're all about. I want to know more about them, you know, that kind of thing. Wow, MTDR, thank you. Thank you for the sub. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, let me show you our, our podcast room. Let me show me. Uh, let me show you our podcast room. Yeah. And today, I have a very, very, very special guest. My dear guest, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Kate. I'm a 2D and 3D digital artist. Uh, I co-run a multimedia label called Ready Made Utopia, where we release um, all kinds of different things, uh, including music, uh, animation. We're coming out with um, a audio drama next month that I'm really excited to talk about. and. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so thankful that that you said yes. We have been setting this up for for a while now and I was very glad that it came to be because you guys have really inspired my journey. I have known you guys for about 2 years now. I have been following because I follow Brawler's World a while ago, you know, two, two or three years ago. Um, and you were recommended to me. And I just immediately kind of fell in love with the style. I was a budding graphic designer, 2D artist at the time. <laughs> and I really, I really looked up to you guys, still do. <laughs> That's, that sounded like, you know, in past tense, that sounded uh, kind of sus, but it really isn't. I really think what you have going on in the style that you have, it's very unique, it's very nice to look at. And I just love to see how the ideas you have get shaped into all these different like drawings and music. And the style at the same time is very consistent. So to me, it's just so, so joyful to see these like characters return that I've known from some drawings and then they, you know, appear in the music video, which is also linked in the pinned comment, by the way. So please, if you haven't checked out Ready Made Utopia, please do. Oh, the second part is even uh, here in the chat. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, hello. <laughs> Alrighty, let me show you some drawings first that Kate did, that they uh, provided to me. Just so you can, you know, see what they're all about in case you don't know. Ready made Utopia yet. Let me show you something. I might have to resize a couple things, but I'm gonna let it up for a second so you can take a good look here first. And I really like this this Y2K aesthetic that some of it, you know, still has. I'm gonna, gonna put it here for now. How's my stomach? My stomach is better. I went to the doctor and he said my problems are not real. And I was really mad about that, but then a day later my problem stopped. So I just kind of I just kind of brooded. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of brooded for a while and I was just like, "Hmm. <laughs> I guess, you know, I guess so." Oh, this one's really cool too with a with a wolf or like dog-like character. Their eyes are so striking. Thank you. And just like the concept of like giant animals and just like, you know, these, uh, how do you say, these like um, daily, daily scenes and all these like ordinary surroundings, I always find very interesting. 
Let me show you some you. some more stuff and then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hide it again. Oh yeah, this one's completely different. This one's also super fun. This reminds me of the games we play on, on stream because we play a lot of RPG Maker games here. I'm a big RPG Maker fan. And this just kind of has that aesthetic. I really like that. Yeah, I'm like, like super Ichayo. inspired by games. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me hide these for now. So now if, if someone comes and they don't know you guys yet, we have some cool stuff to share. Alrighty. <laughs> Kate, I have a couple questions for you. And I like to to start with the first question. Also, Enrique, hello, hello. So we've already established that you're a part of a multimedia label. And I would I would kind of like to understand better what that exactly means and and like what you what you do creatively like what is your creative passion yeah for sure so um ready Made utopia as you said is like this multimedia label so we release um all kinds of different things like music animation this upcoming um audio drama um other little like illustrations and all of these things just kind of built out from the same fictional universe. Uh, so it all just exists within the world of Red and Made Utopia that has all these cute characters in it. And we just kind of try to like use these different forms of media to explore the world and to like share the lore of the world, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what is your part in the label? Like, what are you responsible for? Yeah, so I'm basically the only visual artist for the label. So I do everything from like, um, I do album covers for all the music we release and like promotional material for that. Um, I also did the animated music video. Um, I do all the character designs, um, all the character art. Uh, any environmental art, and a lot of that I'll do in a combination of 3D using Blender and then 2D using like Clip Studio Paint. Um, and then like a lot of times there will be graphic design elements as well, like that I'll do in Illustrator or something. So yeah, I do um, a lot of different <laughs> types of just visual media for it any visual media thing we need <laughs> I'll get it done oh I see that's quite interesting I'd like to know like how did you like initially even come up with the characters like how was the process behind that how did the the label itself uh, came to be yeah so um, my girlfriend Vanessa who is here in the chat as writing Made Utopia uh, she wanted me to, like, design um, art for, like, this EP she had coming out. And I kind of just drew this little character uh, sitting in her room for the album art. And we kind of saw that and we were like, what if we just built this out into more? Like, what if this character existed in a world? Um... I don't know. It really just started pretty small and we kind of slowly grew it out over time. Um, like we started working with other musicians who could like release their music through the world. Um, started exploring different types of uh, media like to <laughs> build it out. Oh, I see. Are there like any particular like themes or like aesthetics that you really like that kind of inspired the world and you know looking looking the way it does? Yeah, so um, I'm really inspired by video games. I think that's my biggest um, inspiration. Um, I've always been like a big Pokemon fan, for example. Um, it gets a lot of comparisons to that. Um, but I just like anything that has, like, cute little creatures. 
like I was obsessed with Hamtaro when I was growing up. I had like 10 Tamagotchis. <laughs> um, I don't know. So definitely like video games, cute things, toys. And then as you mentioned earlier, just kind of like the Y2K aesthetic. Um, and just kind of like a retro technology, but also futuristic. I like to draw from those <laughs> kinds of aesthetics too. And I think that's very well reflected in your world. Like I've been I've been like absorbing like the different uh art pieces you do because they always like give me a certain mood. Like they're very, very strong in the feeling that they portray. And they really give me that Y2K nostalgia at the same time without being like you know like too pandering like too on the nose that this is like y2k like it's more just like the feeling that is is conveyed so beautifully and i've been i've been enjoying it but also j sizzle hello hello photosynthesis hello hello and sudal thank you for your sub Thank you! Yeah, I miss you too. I miss you too. Sorry, I was uh, I was sick earlier this week. My my stomach wasn't doing well. But don't worry, my, my doctor said it's all fake, so you know. <laughs> Rebel says, hello, hello! Hi everyone! Thank you for joining us for the podcast. But yeah, Kate, I totally I totally get that. Totally get that. Like I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, but um, I got one of the songs recommended on Spotify. It's an Opal Voss song, I think. And let me let me see what the the song was called again. I think I messaged messaged you about it. Oh yeah, I don't. <laughs> uh, I'm glad it's getting recommended to people on Spotify. <laughs> let me see. If I can find it real quick. I definitely have it in my in my Spotify, but I don't wanna I don't wanna use my phone because then my <laughs> my tracking will will uh stop. Oh working. yeah. Oh it, it's an it's a nap video or knap. I don't I don't know their name. Uh yeah, nap. Now, ah, and the song is called The Move. Oh yeah, I love yeah. that song. I actually, I did some like very brief like backup vocals on that one. <laughs> oh wow. Here, let me, let me just link it in the, in the chat so people can see. Yeah, I got, I got this one recommended on Spotify like without recognizing that it was your stuff. And I just, I just love the, the album cover. Wow, well, Capra! Capra, thank you for the follow! Thank you, thank you! I hope you're doing amazing today. But, uh, Kate, let me ask you, what does your creative process look like? So, exa for example, when we talk about drawings, how do you go from the idea to, like, the sketch to the finished piece? Like, how does your workflow look like? Yeah, so it definitely depends on like what I'm working on because I work on so many di ty different types of things. So it like really depends. But if I'm just kind of drawing something like that's just a piece of art that's for myself for no greater purpose other than to like make art, a lot of times um, I'm very inspired by my dreams. I have like super vivid dreams. Um, and I'll often pull from that imagery to like into whatever I'm trying to make. And I kind of just like to start drawing and see what happens. Um, and I generally just like kind of start with a sketch and clip studio paint. Uh, I like to block in a lot of color first. Um, And then just, I don't know, kind of keep adding little details that pop into my head until I'm finished. But um, I think with other stuff that's more for like a purpose, like an album cover, for example, um, I'm much more methodical about it. Um, 
like generally if we're releasing a new album i'll want to have a very strong visual direction for it um so i'll gather like a bunch of um images and photos and just aesthetic things into like a pinterest board that i can draw from uh like with naps art for instance it's always super inspired by like early 2000s magazines and toys and like ads for kids um so I don't know. I think that informa- that kind of uh, inspiration gathering is definitely a big part of my process for a lot of the Ready Made Utopia stuff because I do want it to have um, like a strong direction. I think I can definitely see that. I think what you're describing, I can really feel when I look at the album covers. I think those really have that kind of like magazine ad from like the 2000s kind of vibe like like a teenager magazine almost like the same kind of magazine yeah. that would like advertise you a gamecube or a dreamcast you know that kind of thing like youth magazine i think that's that's like a proper exactly for it. yeah i can definitely see that would you say that the initial sketch starts out very different from the final product when you draw uh normally no um like a lot of times i'll try to like sketch more ideas just so i'll feel like i tried alternate things make sure i'm not gonna come up with a better idea but a lot of times i'll just kind of end up going back to whatever i sketched first and using that as like the basis for the rest of my um thing (laughs) yeah i see all right let me hydrate real quick i saw a hydrate redeem in chat Thank you. Thank you for hydrating me. And yeah, this is the, this is the English only stream, please. Yeah, thank you for the hat pad asu. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Sophia Kuhn, hello, hello. And Sayo, oh no, you have to work. Well, this podcast will also be available on YouTube. So don't worry. The VOD will, you know, always be up. You can always catch up with it. And thank you for being here and saying hi. I really appreciate it. And I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm glad I can I can podcast again. My my poor tummy really made me feel like I was dying, but uh, I'm glad that you know this really important day I was able to have with with no issues. And hi. Hiya. So how does like the when you decide to make the world of ready-made utopia bigger like when you're like okay you know we're gonna explore different themes like how do you decide you know what you want to do like you said you have a big project uh coming right that's releasing very soon yeah i can definitely talk about the podcast and how we started doing that yeah um So, um, I'm trying to remember when we even started talking about that. It was definitely years ago, (laughs) probably like two or three years ago, probably three, maybe more. I don't know. But, um, I think one of our biggest roadblocks has been like, I'm the only visual artist on the team and, uh, so there's always like a lot for me to do when it comes to the stuff we're making. Uh, Mm. Because there's all like the album art and then the ads and character designs and all of that type of thing. And we're kind of thinking, well, a podcast would be great because that's so audio based and it doesn't need a lot from me. So it was the type of thing that we could use to like explore the world and the characters and all the environments, but without having without me needing to do a lot because a lot of my time is already devoted to other things with the project. So um, Vanessa and I kind of gathered like three of our other friends who are like really good writers and um, 
super talented creative people and they jumped in and started working on it too. And we just have this whole big um, story in this audio series uh, that, I don't know, it just, it really uh, digs into like what the world is actually like and shows some like an in-depth look on at the characters in the world and all of that, but again, without um, eating a lot of work from me. And obviously, I'm still doing uh, like a decent amount of visual stuff for it, but uh, yeah, you can still understand uh, more about the world without that. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I want to know. Have, have you ever thought about expanding the team? Like hiring or, I don't know, acquiring uh, a second visual artist? Or is, is it more of like, you know, like a pet project where you're like, no, this is like my baby. Like no one else is allowed yeah, to touch like, it. It's kind, of, it's kind of both because on one hand, uh, it would actually be really nice to have um, more people around to like contribute to the visual stuff. Um, but there are a few things like keeping us from doing that so far. Like one, if we bring on an artist, I would really want them to be fairly comp compensated for that. And we don't really have the budget right now to um, pay someone in the way I think they would deserve to be paid for this. Um, and also, I just have kind of like a strong vision of what I want it to look like and I guess I can be a little bit controlling at times <laughs> um, but that being said like I wouldn't be opposed um, if we were able to pay someone well to have it, another artist on the team it just uh, or a financial thing <laughs> I think that makes a lot of sense and I think it's you know it's a very delicate way of walking sometimes thinking like oh you know if i wanna achieve like all of these cool things we might need some extra hands on deck but at the same time it's of course an investment and i think there are only a few indie projects that can kind of like afford to you know even expand at all because most things just kind of start as like a grassroots thing right like a person and a dream or like a couple people and like you know a vision and i think that sometimes when it stays in that core group that makes it be very like concise very concentrated in what it's trying to say because there are less cooks in the kitchen you know yeah exactly and like if there were someone that did want to work purely out of passion and they and money wasn't an issue like, that would be great, but then I would also feel obligated to give them more creative input. So it would be really important that it was, like, the right person whose, like, vision I felt aligned with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Antok's there! Hello! Hello, hello! Nice to see you again. Welcome, welcome. What is your favorite part of working on the, on the world of Ready Made Utopia? Hmm. Um, I think it's just all the different types of things I do. Like, um, before I started working on Ready Made Utopia, I didn't know anything about, like, graphic design, um, or working with, like, text and graphics and stuff. I was just purely an illustrator. And, um, I don't know, doing everything visual for it with like the album art and advertisements and things like that. I've gotten a lot better at graphic design and it was something I just never would have explored otherwise. Uh, same with 3D software. Um, I've gotten really good at that largely through working on the music video, but also just working on other things because 3D is such a good tool for making stuff that you can reuse, I guess. So. My favorite part is definitely just learning all these new skills because it's really fun to figure out new ways to combine them and I love learning new things. I think that's always so fun 
when you're kind of faced with a with a roadblock at first like you're at that step where you're thinking oh i want this thing to do this how can i do that i don't know how to do that it seems so hard you know that, that seems like such a like delicate problem but then you start learning a software or you, you start learning, for example, how to draw hands, you know, the, the nemesis of like every beginner artist is just like, how can I make the hands look good? And when you, when you practice something and learn something new and you acquire that skill, it feels so nice to just be able to kind of like level up in a way and just know that you have yeah, that for skill sure. now. Yeah. yeah, it's like a very good feeling and I get to have it all the time um, because there's also just this really consistent output we have. So there's always like a new thing for me to work on um, because I have this like team of other people that are like depending on me to do stuff. So I don't really have the chance to get in like a creative slump because I'm always going to be doing something and it's nice to be held accountable in that way too. Is ready-made utopia something you work on full-time, if I may ask? Um, sort of. So, I don't currently um, have a job. I am looking for one, just because I do need uh, to get, like, an income to sustain myself, because this doesn't really make me um, enough money to sustain myself, but... Um, Currently, yeah, it is most of what I do. Um, I just finished, um, I was taking a class for like UI, UX design that I just finished up and now I'm hopping into the job market looking for that. But other than my job search and prior to my job search, my class, this is what I do. I see. Well, it was the same for me for a very long time. I think for me, like with streaming, I kind of knew that um, to get to that point where it's like a, a self-running machine almost where, you know, I mean, with streaming, with streaming, it's like a bit different from art where you don't have clients, obviously, but, you know, where the revenue just keeps coming in consistently. I think reaching that point, um, that takes, that takes like a lot of time, a lot of luck, a lot of factors can also be very very hard on like the mental health and can influence your creative decisions so for me i kind of decided that i needed to you know to get a job that could feed myself same as for you and that also kind of gave me the opportunity to be very selective of you know what i stream how i uh behave on stream you know because it's not a it's not a job i don't have to um I don't have to be scared of the numbers just yet. I would obviously like to reach that point. But at the same time, I'm in this very sweet spot where I still have some liberty left to like explore different options, different ideas, different like concepts without fearing of losing this revenue that literally keeps me, um, you know, alive. That's at least yeah. how I kind of look at it. Like a lot, of course, you know, you would like to just have this as your your main job and just work on it full time. But at the same time, you know, it kind of it takes so much out of you. It takes it takes so much uh, responsibility and so much, you know, um, devotion, but also to like an unhealthy degree, almost, right? Yeah, definitely. And I would love for it to um, come like successful enough of a project that I can do it full time. Um, like that's the dream, but I do need, <laughs> um, yeah, to pay my rent. So for now, it's yeah, gotta find a job. <laughs> and I think there's there's nothing wrong with that. And like with your skill set, you're literally like a like a Swiss Army knife, right? You know, 2D and 3D and all these different things. I think you'll have, you know, you won't have uh, that many problems. I want to believe at least. 
and I hope you find something nice that doesn't force you to crunch, doesn't force you to, you know, make things you don't want to do. Oh, let me cough real quick one second. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, I just think that, um, you know, people people might, you know, scoff at that. But at the same time, I think this creative liberty also goes a long way. And I think there's, you know, there's pros and cons of, quote unquote, you know, having made it, having it made as like your main job. But at the same time, also having this like grassroots mentality about it where everything is still possible and you can explore all these avenues without this fear of monetarization just just dangling there you know yeah for sure also adamus hello adamus nice to see you and talks uh we're having podcast time today so I'm mainly responding to my to my podcast guest. I'm of course reading all the messages, but I don't want to uh, derail the conversation too much because I want to learn more about uh, Kate and Ready Made Utopia. Yeah, yeah. What is what is the most difficult part of your creative process, Kate? Um, hmm. I. I think it's probably just um, how constant the workload is. Um, just because, yeah, as I I keep saying, I'm the only uh, 2D, or not 2D, visual artist uh, for the project. So there's always a lot for me to do. Um, and sometimes it can just like get overwhelming um, or like I can feel like I don't have enough time to work on like other things I might want to work on or I might not have the motivation. So I think just um, kind of the workload is probably the hardest part of it. Um, yeah. I think it's so easy to always like assign yourself to many like tasks and projects where it's like, oh, I can do this and I can do this as well. Oh, I don't need someone else uh, for help here. I can just do this thing too. And then you end up with like 20 different responsibilities and you wanna do all of them because you know, you believe in your project and you wanna submit good work. But at some points you can, you know, stretch yourself very thin by doing that creatively. Yeah, like I feel like um, it's definitely I'm in a better place with that now because the music video, the animated music video, I was working on that for like three years and as I was working on it, I was like teaching myself how to animate and how to use 3D software and it was just a very difficult project that I felt like kind of consumed my life and I was working on other stuff alongside it um, just and alongside other things just in my life and just trying to balance all of that was a really big challenge but I also am really happy I did it at the same time so it's it's not something I want to change necessarily but it does get um, overwhelming for sure I think it's also hard sometimes because it's always a learning experience but we are sometimes in these like parts of life where we maybe don't have that space in our head to learn something at the moment where everything else is kind of demanding our attention when we'd rather just work on something we're passionate about and sometimes it can at least for me be very hard to kind of like power through that and stay dedicated like personally like i think the whole work-life balance is very hard to to achieve if you have like a creative passion that you know requires you to practice requires you to to put the work in of course it's very rewarding like like no one says it isn't rewarding but i find that sometimes it's a little bit hard to like you know work eight hours eat something and then you know work on something creatively study learn and then just go to sleep like sometimes yeah, i feel especially... like <laughs> No, you. Yeah. You. Um, especially like because 
if you're working on something creative, I, at least for me, I really want to be in a headspace where I'm excited about what I'm working on and I feel creative about it. And I'm just excited to think about whatever I'm doing. But sometimes if you're overworked, it's hard to approach it with that mindset and it can make it even harder to get things done, I guess. Yeah. Also, Adamus! Ah, oh, thank you for the prime! Thank you for the two months! Thank you! I hope you enjoy your emotes! And Odano, hello! Nice to see you again! Hello, hello! I hope you have been doing well. We're podcasting today! And I feel like what Kate said really resonated with me. Because sometimes, sometimes when I look at something difficult, I am, you know, like I'll look at like an art project or I'll look at like something I want to change about like my streams, like some, some technical stuff. And I just look at it and I'm just like, oh, this is going to require time. <laughs> this is going to be the kind of thing where I really need to sit down really need to kind of focus on it like for a couple hours to like completely understand it and wrap my head around it and there are just days where i can't do that where life kind of you know comes in the way and that can sometimes be be hard because it's so difficult to juggle like all these different things and responsibilities yeah nice definitely and i think sometimes like you're saying you sometimes want to change something on your stream like I feel like that type of thing is the type of thing I could have a lot of fun with and be creative with if I'm in the right headspace but a lot of times I'm just in a headspace where I'm like oh like this is a chore <laughs> um so I really have to remind myself a lot like you like doing this this is fun <laughs> Would you say that um, that could be a bit of like a symptom of like burnout to a certain degree? Yeah, definitely. I think so. Um, cause I do, um, work like long days on my creative stuff and just like with other things in life. But yeah, I definitely, um, have had times where I've felt super burnt out and like, felt unable to like approach what I'm doing with a good mindset. I think that's kind of like in our times, I think every creative kind of goes through that at some point because our social media apps require us to essentially continuously post. Like if you're not posting, you, you know, you're not making new content to attract new people and, you know, get the word out and all that. And I think sometimes it's very difficult when you're when you're starting to work something to kind of prioritize either, oh, this is something I have to do because, you know, I need to, to feed the algorithm machine. Or if, if you're working on something, you're saying, okay, no matter how this turns out, I'm making this for me. I'm making this because I love this, you know, I still love drawing or animating or every, you know, every passion kind of applies to that. And I think in, in today's times where social media is like such a big thing for like each creator, you know, it influences their livelihood like so much. It can be very hard to just say, hey, I have to, you know, I have to pump these out. I have to churn these out to, to have something, have something to show for my time. Yeah, definitely. That makes a big difference for sure. Because I have been um, online posting my art for like a really long time. I started out when I was maybe um, 12. I'm 29 now. Um, and back then I was on like DeviantArt and on smaller like online communities in like Oakakis and stuff like that. I don't know if you're if you remember those or if you're familiar with those. But like I think those types of spaces um they left a lot more room for just doing your creative stuff for fun. Um because they didn't have the algorithms and the co more competitive nature that platforms have now. And they also were so much more just actually dedicated to creativity where now it feels like a lot of every platform people use is just 
kind of a one-size-fits-all platform where it's artists and everyone else. So it's not as much like made for what I'm doing as the things I used in the past were. Hmm. I think like, I think that's the thing with like Twitter too. When you do multiple things, it's like so hard to get the word out. Like sometimes people ask me, they're like, oh, you know, your model looks nice, but what do you stream? And I just kind of sit there and I'm like, just like, yeah, what do I stream? I do karaoke, I do games, I podcast, I do, I don't know, candy testing. Like, there are so many different things I like and it would take way too long to list all of these here. But sometimes people just join for one specific thing and they might not like the other things I do. And that can also kind of be hard to balance, like... I know you you have like such a plethora of things that you release. Like as I said, I discovered you through the music. That's how I, I think that might be how I saw your art first. And I also mm -hmm. followed you on on Instagram like for for the art. And I just thought, wow, that's like so cool that the both music and the art is like completely my thing. <laughs> so that was that was very lucky, but it's also kind of you know difficult to to have to cast the net and just be like, you know, how many how many people like like both of those things. And I think for me, when I stream so many different stream categories, I always develop a lot of self-doubt because I think, oh, you know, everyone who likes the calm chatting streams will not like me raging at like an old video game. That they're, you know, they're not really there for that. And I kind of have to put my foot down with myself and say, hey, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this because I wanna, you know, engage with these like old games and these like, you know, older properties. And I don't, you know, quote unquote, I don't care who watches. I don't care how many people watch because I know we're gonna have a good time and, and do something that, that I enjoy. And I hope I can, you know, share these things and these concepts. And I think that might apply to your output as well. Like you're, you have this whole world, these characters, and also, I, I was I wanted to ask, do you want to send me some some character art, so I can put it up on screen? Yeah, for sure. Let me um, grab that and I'll send it over. But yeah, I totally know what you mean. I mean, I think all the things you listed sound really fun to watch personally. So I think there's probably some overlap there. But I definitely feel that with Ready Made Utopia, like just what we do is pretty niche I guess so the content isn't for everyone but at the same time like the people who do like what we do tend to really really like it so I think it's worth continuing to do it just for those um like really loyal fans because I don't know I love that <laughs> I think for me it's the same because like there there are some creators on YouTube, on Twitch, where I just know the vibe that they bring. Like I could I could watch them peel potatoes for like 20 hours, you know? Like, uh -huh. like I don't care what they do. They can literally, I don't know, peel potatoes, do their taxes. Like I don't care what they do. I just know that their their personality and like what they have to say is so intriguing that I'll have a good time. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm sending these images to you. Yeah. There go. There's kind of a variety. Oh, Antox, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you get to sleep well at least, and I hope that tomorrow looks a bit better for you. I'm sorry you're you're having a hard time with, with the girl you mentioned in your previous message. I just hope that, you know, all things will fall into place with time. And I'm rooting for you. <gasps> Did you peeling potatoes when? Hmm, maybe. But that would be a hand reveal. I don't know how I feel about that. Oh yeah, these are so nice. Oh, I really like your art. Thank you. <laughs> the colors are like, they're so poppin'. Let me just save all of these thank you 
Coloring is definitely, I don't know, probably my favorite part. I just kind of feel like your coloring is like on things that are like vibrant. I'm, I'm going to put the first image up so you guys can see what I mean. Uh, on this image here, I just feel like the the coloration of the eyes and the apples is like, it's so cool. It's, it has such like a shiny kind of like, um, in German we would say plastisch, it means like three-dimensional. It has like such a three-dimensional like feel to it. And I don't know, it's so vibrant and nice. I, I really like it. Let me put the Thank others you. up too. Yeah. Hello, Oskorme, hello! Yeah, we're doing really well. We're podcasting with Kate from Ready Made Utopia. Yeah, yeah, gloves might be okay, I agree. Brother Delicious! Is that the title of this piece? That's, um, these two characters are Apple Guy and Brother Delicious. <laughs> I really <laughs> like the name Brother Delicious. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Ah, so this is the character from the song I like to to listen to. Yeah, this is Nap. He's um, his music is made by our friend Mark, and the character is sort of based on Mark, but also based on myself as like a kid. So he is just a very childlike and fun guy. They really remind me of like an Animal Crossing villager, like a like a sportsy or like lazy one of the the villagers yeah he definitely has lazy villager energy i love animal crossing <laughs> oh me too i think the animal was... crossing character designs really like um i don't know they're like peak character design they're just little guys and sorry i i cut you off oh it's okay um i was just gonna say that um i started like a new Animal Crossing GameCube file a few months ago, and it was really nice to revisit that one. I think the older games are a little bit stronger for Animal Crossing. I think the newer games... You know, I don't want to be like elitist about it, but I don't know. I've, I've had a hard time really getting and sticking to the new Animal Crossing. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I think the newest Animal Crossing has its merits, but it also... I think it's lost a lot of the soul that yeah. it used to have. Yeah, it's very sanitized. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so what can you tell me about Opal here? Yeah, so this is um, Opal Voss. She is the first um, Ready Made Utopia character we ever made. Um, her music um, is all made by uh, Vanessa, who's here in the chat, um, my girlfriend. Um, but yeah, she's like a kind of our flagship main character. She's a pop star. Uh, she's in the world of Running Utopia. She's kind of like an up and coming musician in Three Cloud City, which is um, where most of our content takes place. It's just this big city in the world of Running Utopia. And yeah. <laughs> I think you used this character for some of your profile pictures. I've definitely seen this character in my daily, like, Twitter, not Twitter, uh, Instagram feed. Like, I, I recognize yeah. this character a lot. Yeah, she's definitely, like, our most iconic one. Um, and we use her for, like, it's kind of our mascot, in a way. Uh, they, they very much remind me of one of those aqua pets. But you have this like oh, water yeah. tube with the little guys. Yes, like, I used to have one of those. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's also peak 2000s, like kids' toy <laughs> energy. Yeah, a really niche one. I really like how all the characters here have like the little bios and like the, the hobbies and stuff. I like that they're, their hobbies transit. I kind of vibe with that. Yeah. Let me let me put the last one up on screen as well. This guy, his colors are so pleasing. The blue and the orange is so strong together. This like grayish blue, I very much like it. And the jacket is cute as well. Thank you. Yeah, this is Delmont. 
Um, they're one of the characters, one of the main characters in the podcast that I've been talking about. Um, yeah, they uh, work at this company called the Experience Corporation, which is kind of like the main, uh, kind of the main part of the conceit of this podcast. It's this company where they try to just gather um, as many different experiences as possible, so their employees just go out and are assigned to experience specific things. And Delmont and their partner Cameo are part of like the stranger experiences department. So they're assigned to go out and have like specific experiences with strangers. Um, like, for example, they might be assigned to go out and watch someone's laptop to prevent it from getting stolen and record what that experience is like. So the whole series is just about different assignments they get and how they explore the world <laughs> through those assignments. Well, I can tell you that that experience is very terrifying. I had to do that in the past and I always get so nervous. <laughs> like I always kind of feel like, you know, surely their, their laptop would have never been stolen before, but now that I have it for like two and a half minutes, this is gonna be the time where someone tries to steal it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's the worst when someone says like, hold, hold my baby. I am just like, no, I cannot do this. I'll just drop this thing. Like, oh, I cannot yeah, that's, be trusted. That's terrifying. <laughs> but I really like that. I think this is a very, very cool idea. And I think even the name, like the Experience Corporation, it kind of has this like mysterious touch to it. Like, I'm intrigued. I'm very excited for the for the podcast. Is there already like a website we can like subscribe to just like uh, preemptively before it releases? Like where can yeah, we find so, it? Yeah, so um, in any like podcast app, uh, you should be able to like search the Experience Corporation and you can find it and subscribe to it. There are like a few little teaser um, episodes that are up already. Ooh, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. Is yeah, it gonna be too. on Spotify as well? Uh, yes, it is on Spotify. Okay, cool. Then, then I know where to find it then, since that's my main, you know, podcast app of choosing. Nice. I find it quite interesting uh, or in intriguing. I think would rather be the term that you guys are making a podcast because, like a. It's like an episodic podcast, I can imagine. Like, yes. Um, yeah. It's all like, it's like a narrative um, fiction podcast. I think for me, those kind of things are kind of like a core childhood experience as well. Because in Germany, we had two very big like children's audio book thingies, which luckily are also available on Spotify. So lots of, lots of, you know, mid-twenties people are now like rediscovering these like old stories from their, their childhood that are readily available on Spotify. So for all my German viewers, I know you are there. We talk frequently. Uh, I'm talking about TKKG und uh, die drei Fragezeichen. Yeah, Van Zalden, yeah, I, I knew you were there. I knew it. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I can't obviously t talk too much about the English speaking side of things since I didn't grow up with, you know, English audiobooks when I was young. But I knew, you know, be before before I kind of understood media better when I was you know, like younger, I listened to like the Harry Potter books as an audiobook. Like nowadays, oh, yeah. nowadays I'm very miffed, very miffed about like what is going on with that franchise. I find it quite, uh, how do you say, um, bigoted and distasteful. But um, it did, you know, kind of shape shape my childhood to to a good degree. And I think the audiobooks were very, very good for that. And I'm yeah, excited I... for the stories you have to tell. Oh, apologies. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, there was a popular, like, audio series um, for, like, German people our age. Because um, I don't think there was really anything like that in the U.S., at least not that I was aware of. But I did also listen to the Harry Potter audiobooks um, when I was a kid. But um, 
I feel like there wasn't anything that was more of like a dedicated audio series that I knew of. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, it's like, it's not a medium I feel like that many people are into. So I'm curious to see if what we made is something people are going to be curious about. And I hope they are. <laughs> I'm gonna be there, I can promise you that. I think that's very exciting. And I know a lot of people who listen to like audio dramas and like audio like... I almost kind of want to say like these like experience videos or where like a story is being told in like audio form. I think that's gonna be very cool, like I am quite excited for that. And Benny, thank you! Thank you for your prime! Benny, I appreciate it. It's so nice of you. Thank you so much. And Van Zalden is right. Like it's kind of cool how these like uh, old children's properties how they're they're kind of getting more popular again because they were really good. It's like a it's like a mystery thing. It's like free school boys that kind of like solve mysteries like in in their like state. I think they're from California. I might be wrong. Okay, that's so interesting. I like looked it up on my phone. I'm just like looking at little pictures of it. <laughs> yeah, it used to be like a very, um, very long running um, book series and like video cassettes, not video, audio cassettes thing. Like my parents would like put it in the car to, oh, to shut yeah. me up during long car rides. <laughs> Oh, Benny, thank you. I appreciate it. I see it more of like, uh, you know, so supporting, supporting the channel than like the simp tags. But I appreciate that you chose me for your prime. It means a lot. But yeah, there, there's one question I really wanted to ask. And that's, how did you come up with the name Ready Made Utopia? Yeah, um, so... I don't remember the details exactly, but um, in the when we very first started working on it, this is probably like 2018, we were trying to think of what in the world we could call it, and we were just kind of sitting around like spitballing different names, and nothing sounded right, and we were just kind of getting really frustrated because it's like difficult to come up with a name for I don't know, just coming up with names in general is hard. And I think one of our friends just like opened this poetry book he had and chose like a random phrase from it and it happened to be Ready Made Utopia, which I don't think I've like shared that story before, but that's how we were just like, oh, that seems like it works. Let's just commit to it and it'll, it'll work. <laughs> I always kind of thought it had this like, cool ring to it because it's this you know do you call it a di dichotomy i'm not a native english speaker so sometimes mm -hmm. i struggle a little bit um where it's like you know utopia is like this this like unachievable perfect thing where everything is just flawless you know you, you kind of you don't have to work for anything it's just perfect you know mm -hmm. it's it's ple you know pleasant and and perfect but a ready-made kind of implies this like manufactured nature about it yeah and like that i feel like it definitely reflects the nature of the world because um i don't know it kind of evokes the feeling of how it is this very like high-tech world and it does sort of feel like a utopia but there is something that's not fully utopian about it i guess because, like, I don't know. I don't see it as, like, a super dark and sinister world, but I don't think it's a true utopia either. <laughs> that kind of... That's kind of reminiscent of our world in a way, then, isn't it? Because, you know, when, when you grow up, usually you get told, like, by, you know, your teachers, by your parents that, you know, everything just kind of works, you know, like, like, justice works, the police works, taxes work. You know, like, like everything is just kind of just like the system that just kind of, you know, functions and everything is nice and there are no, no real problems. At least as a yeah, child, I you wish. maybe don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think this kind of implicit that, you know, in fact, not everything is perfect. Like, 
it might be a bit deeper than that. Like, it does need to be deep and, like, uh, it does need to be dark and, like, menacing or, I don't know, like, edgy. But I think kind of implying that even in this, like, perfect state, in this, like, perfect, I don't know, world. I don't want to say state is in, like, country. State is in, like, mm -hmm. you know, a state of being. Like, in this, in this perfect, like, environment. Even there... There's just this like mundane nature to it by being, you know, like manufactured. It's just like a, I don't know, it's such like a, I don't know, obtainable thing. Because manufacture kind of implies that, you know, it's it's from the, like a factory, right? It's just yeah. artificial. Yeah, and I definitely picture this world as being a lot nicer than ours. Um... Like when I'm thinking about it, um, like sometimes we'll make like different decisions about uh, what sort of things happen in this world, like what sorts of problems they have they have in this world. Like one thing, for example, I really didn't want the world of Ready Made Utopia to have like transphobic people in it. Like I didn't want that to be a common problem there, for instance. Um, so I do imagine it as a world that is a lot more accepting and like equal and all that but I also do want it to have like darkness to it still and have problems because like it's not exciting if it's just all perfect <laughs> yeah and I think you're definitely telling a story with that and also Kuro hello hello raiders thank you for the raid hello I hope you had a good stream Kuro I hope you I hope you had a good time raiders thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy the podcast Kuro if you need to drink or eat or sleep anything you know streaming is exhausting take a good break and thank you for for being here and kite hello kite nice to see you but yeah, I I feel like you really struck the mark there. Like, I feel like Ready Made Utopia has this perfect amount of, like... I don't want to say, like, cynicism. It's not, like... I wouldn't say it's, like, you know, kind of, like, grumpy about it. I wouldn't say that. But there is, like, a certain, like, hint of, like mystery or like melancholy almost by saying that it's uh ready-made yeah sorry that i'm going like english to say about this by the way i'm just very bad at like concisely saying what i feel so i i, I sometimes like meander around the point for a little bit oh yeah no need to apologize it's definitely interesting i i think i got it now i think the the word ready-made it cheapens this, like, this perfect image one has of a new utopia. I think now I got it. This would earn me full marks in my, <laughs> my English essay. It would, yeah. Like, you really did hit on exactly kind of what we're going for with that. I'm, I'm glad. I've been, you know, I've been enjoying the art. I've been listening to, to the music. And I'm just excited where this will go. And I think the podcast is going to be a lot of fun. Quite excited. It really is. It has like all this really amazing music to, uh, I think there are like 60 different tracks made for it already. And um, there's great sound design. The voice acting is awesome. I'm very excited for it. <laughs> And Kite says, like a ready-made meal, like a freezer meal. Yeah, that's kind of the same thing. Like when you get a freezer meal and it says like, you know, delicious or like, you know, this is like a scrumptious feast, you know, like, you know, it's a ready-made meal. So, you know, it's not going to be the most, you know, like scrumptious mega feast. But the box still kind of tries to sell you that idea. Like the box yeah. still says, you know, with like 5% more meat. <laughs> That kind of thing. Yeah, I like that comparison. <laughs> in in total, what what drives you to create? What has been your driving force behind Ready Made Utopia besides like telling a story? Like what's your personal journey with it? Um I partly I just really um 
care about it as a project and I want to reach more people with it. And um, I don't know, I have fun with what we do. I love helping to like release the music and seeing what different like projects we pursue next. But um, I don't know. I think the main thing is just like this personal desire I have to keep working on it and to keep building it out. And I think, I think that's like such a healthy way, like that's such a like healthy goal to have. Where as we said earlier, it isn't really about like the money and the, the social media appeal. Those things would be nice, of course, but I think this like authentic, you know, like, like, I don't know, like exploring this world and all these things that it has to say is so much nicer and like more authentic than thinking about like, oh, let's make, I don't know, let's make a G Fuel like tie-in character. <laughs> he lives in, in G Fuel, I don't know, G Fuel County. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, I mean, I would absolutely love for it to become a huge success and for a ton of people to know about it and for it to um, get better reach. But I try to keep my focus on like personal fulfillment with it because if I don't then I'll just get so frustrated. <laughs> yeah, and I think in, in that way we're definitely alike. Like that's that's how I have to kind of look at my streams. Like sometimes I get really into the nitty gritty and I'm thinking like, oh, if I've done this like differently, this this post wouldn't have flopped, for example. This would have reached more people if I, I don't know, used a different hashtag, posted an hour later or an hour earlier. But at the same time, this kind of stuff just gives me brain worms if I overthink it. I feel like, or I at least kind of try to do that. I only try to tweet when I have something to say. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of where, you know, like I, I know that realistically I should like clip my streams like make more secondary content like tiktoks and and youtube shorts and that kind of stuff but like i can't be bothered i really can't be bothered because obsessing over it just makes me unhappy in the long run i feel yeah and like i definitely feel like i sometimes i feel like we should be posting more because you're supposed to post consistently and do these certain things to like get the algorithm to work. But I also really care about the quality of what I post and I just hate putting things out that I feel like we're just thrown together for the purpose of like the algorithm because I don't want people to go to my page and see all this content that I don't feel actually proud of or that I don't feel like represents <laughs> what I do. So it's hard to balance that when you're trying to get better reach. <laughs> that definitely. And I think it's also kind of hard to describe to someone who has never heard of you before in like a sentence or two what you're all about, which is what social media kind of boils down to. And I can just imagine like for you guys with like all the different avenues you explore, it must be sometimes be hard to like be concise you know and and easy to understand about it to like acquire yeah you know, it's new people. <laughs> yeah it's really hard to like summarize what exactly our project is um a lot of times i'll kind of just be like oh just go to our page and look at it <laughs> that's the best way to see i think what i always do is I kind of, I go to my social medias every couple months and I look back at the content I produced in the last couple months and then I'll slightly adjust my bios to kind of reflect that change because I have just kind of accepted that my content will continuously change, it will continuously evolve and morph and you know, I will explore like all the different avenues. Like very soon, for example, just to plug my my own stream real quick. I ordered some Tamagotchi. There might be some cool retro Tamagotchi stuff to unbox. I got some Tamagotchi from Japan. 
Sasha. Very, very, very cool. Oh, trick or sweet. So hello, hello. Oh, please give them a big shout out. Hello, hello. Nice to see you here. But yeah, we have some some cool things to unbox. I want to show you guys my art books, my figures. Like there is definitely lots of stuff. I just kind of wanna wanna show to everyone. Yeah, I still have to get used to the hand cam uh, setup because I just you know I don't want to like. I don't want to dox myself and I'm always kind of very close to doing that like when I have the option it seems like I, I immediately blunder and trip and you know I just want to make sure the setup is like completely foolproof that I can show you guys like all my all my cool little items yeah hello yep. hello but yeah apologies I, I think I, I derailed <laughs> a little bit oh no I'm that sounds exciting. I love Tamagotchis. I I had them when I was a kid and I would just, every time a new generation came out, I would get it. I have like probably 10 of them. <laughs> it was the same for me too. I started, I think I started with Tamagotchi in like second grade. And then mm -hmm. I just kept buying everyone, like every Tama that came out after that. Till the music star. I don't know if you know the music star. I vaguely remember that, but I know I didn't have that one. That was my last one. That was the how do you say the the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> like that was yeah. the one where I was already kind of like, okay, these aren't being like marketed as much anymore. The ideas don't seem to be like that fresh. Like something is going on, and I I don't like it. And they made have the you, color Thomas. Have you gotten one since then? Like, have you gotten one of the more recent ones? Funnily enough, I have been avoiding them. Like, I have acquired multiple old and, like, obscure Thomas. I got some, like, I got one called the Teku Teku Angel, which is very cute. It's like a pedometer, which tracks, like, your steps every day. And you have like a little guy who, who walks along with you, which is like very cute. And for the original Tamagotchi, I got like some... I don't know if you're familiar with the Japanese terms or if you know the American terms for them. Um, I probably know the American ones, but I don't know. <laughs> so the ones I like the most, which I still collect, are the Entama and Uratama. Entama is generation 4, that's where your Tamagotchi had like a round antenna, like a round bubble, round circle. Yes, I, I definitely had one of those. I had like the yellowish orange one with like the purple circle. <laughs> I think I know that one. And those are like, the, your Tamagotchi can like have a job and you can like raise different stats to make it evolve into like a different adult. That's my favorite. Yes, I love that one. I think that's like literally peak to be honest. I think that one had like the most like concise thing going on. And then the one after that, the 4.5, that has like a star-shaped antenna. Yes. Yeah, those are my that favorite too. ones. Those are expensive now, by the way. If you still have one of those babies, they're worth up to 300, 400 bucks now. Wow. I do have mine still, but I would never sell them. <laughs> I think with mine, I just know that I would never be satisfied with what someone would pay for it. Like, I would, I would like, the bragging rights and the love for something that, you know, I had since I was a child is more important to me than any money that I might get. You know, of course, if it's, like, life-changing money, if someone says, like, oh, this is worth, like, a million, then I think, yeah, I can... I might part with it. <laughs> a million would definitely, you know, change change my life. I think then I could think about it, maybe. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. Oh, Kuro, yeah, enjoy your chocolate chai latte. Ooh, it sounds nice. I like that. It sounds very nice. So, one thing I do want to know is how did you initially start out with, like, drawing and creating in general and how did you find your niche like how did that just kind of 
Because you talk yeah, about so... ready-made utopia, but like what happened before that, basically? Yeah, uh, it's been a long time. I've been, um, I think, I was like always interested in. Sorry. Um, I was always interested in art, like it's always been something I really loved, so I was drawing all the time as a kid. And when I was like 12, in maybe 2006 or so, I discovered um, Oakaki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, I think I'm not. Yeah, so they were kind of, they were really popular in like the mid to late like 2000s and they were these kind of image boards and they had these like java based drawing apps in them so you could draw on these websites and then like post what you made um onto this image board and other people in the community could like comment on it and i joined one that was pokemon themed um and I just kind of met all these other um, artists on there that were around my age. I was like 12 years old. And they were just all really into art and kind of like into improving their skills. And we would just draw all the time. Um, and we made our own site, like our own Oakaki board where we could do this. And um, I don't know, I was a big Pokemon artist for a while. Um, and I got really into like the DeviantArt community, uh, making my own characters and making fan art and just like learning how to be a better artist and uh, discovering stuff that inspired me. And that's really where like, um, I don't know, I think without that I probably wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> I find it so funny that Pokemon started like your your creative journey because I know so many people for for that is the case like Pokemon really just kind of I don't know Pokemon just really brought out the creativity in so many people with like the fan yeah. art and even like the small things like you know like the trainer sonas the like when Pokemon Mystery Dungeon came out I had a field day like drawing my own little like rescue team and stuff yeah, me too. I used to make um, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon comics. Oh. I was in like this group for Pokemon Mystery Dungeon on DeviantArt. Oh my god, I, I read would, like, so many of those. Yeah, me too. I think that was like peak internet for me. Like I used to be on like a lot of like Splinter forums for like different interests. It's so, like the Tamagotchi forum, the like the Pokemon forum. And that's like a part of how I learned English because I was dissatisfied by the state of like German forums most of the time mm -hmm. because, you know, like Germany gets everything one year like after the US. It's like one or 1 1.5 years. It's like a delay. So if you're like a, you know, anime or like manga fan from like the 2000s, you have to rely on like English media if you really want to know what releases, like what is going on with like your favorite shows. So I started because I think it was like the, the German version of like uh, Bulbapedia, which is called Biza Fans, by the way. I know that Biza Fans um, was really crappy in like um, <laughs> talking about Pokemon Black and White, which were coming out at the time. Like, they didn't have any info because, you know, they they didn't like posting leaks, they didn't like researching that much. And I think Cerebi wasn't a thing at the time. I think I didn't know about Cerebi. So I started kind of like branching out to like English sites and I found this fan art of Zoroark. And I thought like, wow, this is like the coolest thing ever. And that's when I became like very active in like Pokemon fan circles and there's so many artists with like their their own characters that were just so endearing to me uh, I love that and that's like such a it seems like such a fun and like immersive way to like learn a language <laughs> or like improve because you're just I don't know seeing people talk in like regular 
context about something you're interested in. It just seems like a nice way to learn something. I feel like for me, reading manga was like a big part of it as well. Because I just got dissatisfied by the German version being stuck at like chapter 10. And the American fan, you know, uploaded fan translation being at like chapter 45. And I was just thinking, yeah. okay, like this is going to be the part where I'm going to have to buy the bullet, learn English so I can at least, you know, learn my my fan fiction. Like so, so I can understand my, my fan fiction. And like... I read a lot of Dojin comics. I talk about that sometimes on on stream. I used to be a big Dojin guy when I was when I was very young, and I just read like so many like fan manga for like Soul Eater, for Naruto. Oh yeah. And then later Steven Universe. I like the the fan comics and like the the little like yeah you know like like fan canons between the characters. I always liked a lot. And I, I just think in that way, fandom can be very, very fun when you have this kind of place where all your favorite little guys are there and they're being drawn by so many, you know, talented people. It's always so nice to, to see. Yeah, like, I just feel like um, communities like that just feed creativity so well. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I think with the Pokemon community, there's just something about it. I don't really know how to how to put it into words. I guess you kind of had to be there to to understand. I think it's a bit similar maybe to the Warrior Cats community. Oh, is... I was so into that when I was young. <laughs> I watched the like, what did you call it again? The... Um... It wasn't AMV, it was kind of like that, but it was like a multi-animator project. I think you call it MAP, right? Yeah, I don't... That seems right to me. Yeah, it sounds but like But I know word. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, where it's like... I don't want to say it's like reanimated, because obviously Warrior Cats didn't have like a cartoon, I think. I think it was just the books. But I watched so many of those. I had so many like cat OCs and stuff. And I didn't even read the books. I didn't realize we had the books in German. I just consumed the fan content and kind of went along with it. Yeah, I loved the books and I used to write like fan fiction and I would like pretend to be a warrior cat with my friends at recess. <gasps> oh, like <laughs> me too. We also used to pretend to be uh, dungeon delvers from Mystery Dungeon. We'd have our own little rescue teams and then we'd like... We pretend that like an another friend on like the the play place was like the Pokemon we needed to rescue. So we try to like, you know, to rescue them while others were trying to like push us down from the <laughs> So like I don't know what you call it, the, the jungle gym, the like the, the, yeah, the I thingy. love that. That's so cute. Oh, a mad is something else. A mad is like uh that's in the Nico Nico Doga community. That's like a big thing. Um, and Mad is like a meme video. It's like a very, very old. I don't know if Mads are still a thing. They might be. It's like a um, kind of like a YouTube poop, but like musically. So they will take like samples from like I don't know a McDonald's advertising or a cartoon or like a like a celebrity saying something and they'll cut it into like a song and most of the time it has like Toho references or like you know anime references I think that's how you describe a, a mad it's kind of like a more of like a music thing but yeah um Kate do you have any advice for young aspiring creators hmm uh well, I feel like one thing, um, when I was just starting uh, to get into art, I feel like I had so much more enthusiasm and I was just so excited to draw stuff. And I just went at it with this like reckless abandon kind of. And I think the more you learn, the more critical you can be on yourself sometimes. And I don't know, I think I would advise people to try to like, hang on to that, like, 
remember to have fun with it and just like do things like draw things you feel like drawing and pursue uh types of media that you find interesting and i think people should like not worry too much about success or like doing things right like i think it's important to just follow what interests you um and i also remember uh, I had this phase for a while when I was just getting into art where I felt like it was really important to like have a style that was very consistent and defined and I would always be like worried about deviating from that because I thought I just needed to draw the same way all the time for some reason and I see like artists that have that mindset a lot and I don't know I think there's nothing wrong with trying out new things because ultimately, like, whatever you make, uh, it's gonna be in your style just because it's coming from you, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I kind of <laughs> went off on a weird tangent there. No, I think, I think you're very, very reasonable about it because um, I know back in the day when I used to do art... I had a very, very hard time because I started out drawing a lot of Pokemon fan art. And that was the only thing I used to draw. I used to pick a Pokemon, put it in a situation, draw a background and call it a day. Like a, a Mudkip in a swamp, a dust clubs in a, in a spooky manner, you know, that kind of thing. I, I tried to like... When I was doing art, I kind of tried to like make my own Pokemon cards. Like I wanted it to be like a scene, you know, out of the daily life of that Pokemon. That's something I really enjoyed doing. And I remember at some point I didn't really want to draw Pokemon anymore. And I kind of moved on to like League of Legends characters because that was like the thing I really cared about at the time. And I remember a friend, like a distant friend, like not a, not a close friend, but like a person that interacted with my art a lot, messaged me and said like, hey, you can only draw Pokemon. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like what you're posting. Go back to the schedule programming, please. And I just thought, <laughs> oh my god. I, <laughs> I was like so, you know, like uh, intimidated as a, as a kid. I thought, oh no, what if people won't like my other drawings? That is so, that's so funny. But yeah, like people definitely do that. Like they'll expect artists to just keep doing the same thing that they like. But I don't know. There's at the same time, there's like less, um, it's less of a, it's not really a real problem, I guess. Like if you're just drawing, if you keep drawing because it's what you want to do and it's something you're passionate about, like, it shouldn't really matter, like, what your audience wants. <laughs> it should ultimately be about you. That's true. And I think, you know, you can only grow by kind of escaping the boundaries of what you know. I think that, you know, people will always come and go regardless of if you draw the same thing or not. It's just, you know, it's just how it is. Like, at some point, people might move on onto something else they enjoy more. And I think it's just important to stay true to yourself and just be like, yeah, you know, I want to draw this because I like it. Yeah, and I feel like everyone's style and, like, the subject matter, it's going to, like, evolve as they improve and keep drawing or whatever like it's a natural thing that's going to happen and I think one of the only ways to grow is to explore these other things you're interested in and try new things through your art so I feel like people should be less afraid of like um I don't know stepping outside of whatever they feel like their defined style is yeah and I think like with style is even more difficult right because there are so many, like, for young artists, there are so many videos where it says, you know, don't draw like this, don't draw like that, don't shade like this, don't shade like that. Use these tools, use these brushes. And I think for a lot of people starting out, it kind of seems like, you know, like a, 
oh, if I use like all these bells and whistles, my art's gonna turn out perfect and it's gonna be like, you know, Michelangelo level of like realism, like instantly, if I just follow all these steps. And in the end of the day, I think you only develop a style after having tried out different things. And it's also okay to have more than one style and to, yeah. you know, change between them and, and, you know, like, I don't know, like, you, you aren't locked in for life, you know, you aren't married to, to a style. You can divorce a style. I mean, in that way, you are married to a style. You can, you know, divorcing is legal and it's, you know, should be more socially acceptable. So, yeah, so, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, because there are like so many, I feel like there's so much advice that makes people feel like there are certain things they can't do. Like for a while, I felt like it was very wrong of me to ever copy um, a drawing that someone else did. And like when I say that, I mean like just copying it for personal reference, like in a sketchbook or something. But I had this professor when I was in college who would as part of our homework, we would have to copy illustrations or like frames, like comic panels, and we just have to try to copy them exactly. And it was just a really great way to like learn um, new techniques and new styles and new ways to like think while you're drawing. And I think more people should do that. Just like copy other drawings. And I think it's something a lot of people are very afraid to do because there's always so much discourse around like that type of thing. <laughs> I think it's very, very cool that your professor like taught that in such like a non-judgmental way. Like I think it's so cool that you had this environment that let you learn these techniques without, you know, you having to like be ashamed about like, you know, getting canceled and like all of that. I think that's like a that's a very consistent part of learning is like seeing something, you know, asking how it works and like trying to imitate it. And I think it's cool that your that your college actually encouraged that because as you said, it's such a such a wonderful way to learn more about the techniques and like how to do these things. Yeah, it was I do it all the time now and it's such a I'm really glad that I had this teacher to tell me that it's okay. It's, it's so, um, it's also just like, if I feel like I want to draw to practice and I don't know what to draw, now I can just easily just be like, okay, well, I'm just going to do a study in my sketchbook of someone else's art. Yeah. Or I mean of a photo, but I was just like studying, I was drawing from life a lot and I felt like it was never okay for me to draw from other art, but turns out it is and it's also helpful <laughs> yeah i think again there is of course um there's of course like a line to be drawn where but but i don't think like you're doing that where it's like you wouldn't you wouldn't copy something and then try to like profit from it or pass it on as your own obviously you know if you're a starting artist don't do that that's not nice but yeah of course I mean, you you know, if they t when they teach you fundamentals in art school, most of the time they have you copy things from life, you know, the things that you see with like your own eyes. And I don't think that drawings are any different than that, especially if you want to learn a specific technique. It's like we're all permanently influenced by the things we consume art wise. We're always shaped by our favorite kids cartoons and our favorite like artists and musicians and TV shows, that kind of thing. So I think such like an intimate way of like studying something can do a lot of good. Yeah, exactly. I think for me, there is like also, um, for me, there was like a big part um, where I used to write a lot of fan fiction and I used to make like my own like fan OCs. I used to use like bases and these like character makers a lot when I was young. 
Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a very hard time when the whole Mary Sue thing began. Because people were starting to make videos like, these are the five signs that your character is a horrible Mary Sue who brings famine, war, and death over the land and should not be trusted. And I had yeah. such a hard time with that because I thought, oh no, you know, I can't make characters like this. I can't, you know, oh, my, my character has, I don't know, too many, too many wings. My character has too many different eye colors. <laughs> Too, too many highlights in their hair. They're too, you know, quote-unquote cringe. And I think it's yeah, just... I, yeah, you I first. Have... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I remember that moment in, like, culture so well, too. Like, everyone was just, like, obsessed with analyzing every character and seeing if they were a Mary Sue or not. And I remember that making me, like, really self-conscious, too. Um... And I think that type of thing is always going to happen in these little communities, especially when people are like young and they can take things a little too far. But I don't know. I understand why that type of thing is talked about, but I think people should take it a little less seriously and just kind of make stuff that they that makes them happy. I kind of sometimes feel like people don't realize that only, only the you know the fact that someone made an OC that they don't like, doesn't change anything about the original show, doesn't change anything, you know, doesn't concern them. Like if my OC is called Rainbow Diamond and they only have one eye and they have eighty angel wings. That is like my little guy that, you know, that has nothing to do with their life and the, the show, you know, the characters like based upon. I kind of feel like sometimes people pull these things for like no good reasons. And the people who, who get the worst end of it are always the kids. Because kids start, you know, with like cramming a million traits into like their favorite little fella. <laughs> And it's always, you know, yeah. yeah, it's they're always the ones that get bullied the hardest for those kind of things. And they, you know, they try to fit in. They want to be cool. They want to, you know, pass as like a cool kid. And then it's, you know, it, it almost kind of becomes sad when people just try to de-Mary Sue their, their character that, you know, they used to like. Yeah, I definitely did that to a few of my characters when yeah. I was a kid. Like, I remember I had this, like, wolf character that had, like, wings and two tails. And it was, like, white with all these rainbow markings. And I thought she was so cool. And then one day I was just like, oh, I, like, I hate this character now, actually. Like, I'm too cool for, for that. I bet the character shed a tear. Yeah. It's like the Toy Story thing with Woody where it's like, I don't want to play with you anymore. Exactly. I remember I used to watch a, like, I was so influenced by, like, YouTube videos as a kid. I used a lot of these, like, don't draw things this way. Don't write your characters that way. And it was always just like, yeah, you know, don't give them, like, too many bright hair colors and, like, all these things. And... I think that was like the worst era of the internet, where we all yeah, made like fun of things. Yeah, because there's like, <laughs> there's no nuance to rules like that either. Yeah. Like I feel like a big one people always say is like, don't shade with black, and it's like you can though, you, it's fine. <laughs> Sometimes, a lot of the time actually. I was about to say it depends on the purpose, and again, it's your drawing. Like, who's gonna stop you? There's no, there's not gonna be, like, a falling piano from the sky if you decide to, you know, shade with black or use the smudge tool. And I think, especially all oh, the smudge tool, the smudge tool, my, my beloved. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think when I look back at, like, my own old art, you know, I always have this kind of, like, little tear running down my, my cheek because I'm just like, yeah, she didn't know what she was doing. She had no idea what layers were, but goddamn, 
mixing a little black with that with that color and smudging it all over the you know the edges of the drawing she definitely knew how to do that and she had a lot of fun <laughs> yeah i love seeing art that like new like beginner artists make i just um there's just something special about it and i like seeing the types of choices they make i agree i agree also hiromi yeah I'm I'm feeling a bit better, yeah. I'm still definitely feeling sick. Like I can tell you that. I'll uh, I'll take it easy till Monday, and I will probably like monitor my health. And if it happens again, I'll go to the the doctor who just told me to drink more water and chillax. That was my advice for stomach cramps to just chillax a little bit. So you know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that, but it's okay. I'm, I'm doing fine now. Also, Ray. Hello, Ray. Nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think there's something so beautiful. It's kind of almost like outsider art. It's just, it's just very, very fun to just kind of, kind of see that. Like, there, there is like such a... There's such a beauty in, you know, not knowing how to do something, but still trying your best to, like, portray your favorite character with, like, all their, their little things. Like... Yeah. And, like, I feel like new artists are always so embarrassed about it. Like, they're just like, oh my god, I'm sorry, I know this sucks. And I'm just like, no, it is so beautiful and I love it. Like, I want to see everyone's art. Back in the day, my characters always used to have their arms behind their back because I was too scared of drawing like the arms and the hands. So everyone had this very like timid, timid pose in a way, or they had their hands in like their pockets. So the only I always did that too. <laughs> the the only the only two genders I knew were emo and like timid little girl with with arms <laughs> behind back. Those were the only two, <laughs> two variables. Also, I'm doing well. Thank you, Ray. I'm doing very well. I'm podcasting today. Thank you for being here. We're talking to Kate from Ready Made Utopia. Um, so, for you, what was like the hardest thing when you started getting into drawing? Hmm. Um, I think probably like learning to accept criticism. Um, so I think early on, and it's like so fair for like a child to not um, really know how to take criticism well. Like I was very defensive and I just saw it as like people being cruel if they told me something I could improve. Um, but just figuring out how to um, take that and learn from it was difficult, but also so important because I just find it so valuable now. Um, and I think some of my biggest like steps forward when I was just getting started were from people like directly telling me things I could do better. Like I remember I used to, when I was coloring things in, I would... I think the way I shaded things, like I wasn't bold enough with like the darks, like I didn't go dark enough with my shadows, I didn't go light enough with my highlights, and I remember someone telling me that and just being kind of like mad at them at first, but then I took their criticism into account and like it made a huge difference. So just uh, learning how to have a more healthy mindset about that and being open to making changes and learning. Yeah. Was hard, but um, I don't know. It's. I love getting. Getting advice like that was really nice, too. I feel with advice, you always have so careful. Because, like, sometimes you allow your friends to, like, critique one drawing, and then suddenly everyone's a critic, and everyone has, like, so many things to say. 
Like, you know, sometimes I want to be done with drawing and just kind of enjoy it and just kind of say, you know, hey, I, I willed this into existence and, you know, I'm happy with, like, the result for the time and effort I put in. And sometimes I think with, with criticism, the worst thing for me is when you show someone something and they don't get it. Like, they just don't get it at all. And they give you, like, criticism and you're thinking, like, yeah, you know, I won't do that. <laughs> that's not what this is, like, about. But that's, you know, yeah. that, that's the point where you have there's, to kind of set boundaries. There's definitely, like, a time and place. Like, there are absolutely times where I've worked on something and I show someone... And I'm just like, I do not want you to say anything bad about this right now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And yeah, right, I'm, I'm from Germany. I lived in the UK for six months. And I intend to return back to the UK. I just uh, need to save some money for my, for my visa. And Kate is from the US of A. So, so that's nice, that's nice. I always enjoy interviewing people from different countries. And I think America might be the most represented country for my podcast, funnily enough. Oh, not country, continent, North, North America. But yeah, I find that quite interesting. So many talented people, so many nice people. But Kate, what do you do when you hit a dead end on a project? Um... Definitely, I talk to someone about it. Like, I try to get a new perspective on it, uh, mostly uh, from my girlfriend, because she and I co-own Ready Made Utopia, so we're collaborating all the time. But I, um, I don't get stuck that often, but when I do, it's almost always fixed, like, very quickly by me just talking through it with someone, because, um... There's, um, it's normally just, like, my mindset or the way I'm looking at it that is my problem, and I just need to, like, figure out a new way to move forward, um, and I can figure that out by talking to someone about what I'm working on, um, or I'll also just, if I'm working on a big project, I find it really helpful to, like, just write down a list of all the different aspects of it that I need to either get done or think about. Um, and that'll help me try to just kind of figure out what my next step is. Um, or if I'm just feeling creatively stuck in general, I'll just try to um, mess around in software or with like a new medium or just like download some new brushes I haven't used before and just use something new and that kind of helps to get me inspired so you're kind of getting like a fresh perspective basically by trying out new mediums and new things yeah because i definitely have a tendency um to get stuck in a specific like thought process when I'm working on something and I'll just get very focused on this one thing and it'll seem impossible to like move past or move out in a different way I just, I just need to find ways to get out of that if that makes sense yeah of course um but like I think sometimes I think sometimes there's like a difference between you know being being stuck too like, sometimes you reach the point where it's really just burnout. Like, sometimes you really reach that point where everything is exhausting, nothing makes sense, nothing is working. You know, like, the, the cogs stop stop turning. How do you deal with that? How, how do you deal with, with a situation where you are just fully exhausted? Yeah. Um, in that case, I make myself take like a full day or two just off just not try to work on whatever it is I'm stuck on at all and just like relax I don't know like clean my apartment up and it also really helps for me to like watch a good movie like 
something that might inspire me or make me think in a different way or just like I don't know consume media that's like good that is inspiring um that kind of helps me um I don't know it's a way to relax and also just a way for me to feel better about what I'm doing again but stepping away is definitely important sometimes I really, I really like the point that you brought up about consuming good media which inspires you because I feel like that's so important, that can change so much, like sometimes you just see a good movie or you listen to a good song and suddenly you know the juice is back, like the battery is completely filled up, you, you know exactly what you want to do and I always think that's such a magical feeling, you know, when you're back in the in the flow like that. Yeah, like any movie by Satoshi Kon, it just makes me feel so inspired. Like I, Paprika or Perfect Blue. I finished uh, Paranoia Agent recently. I haven't seen that yet, and I really want to, because I think I would love it. You should. It's a very, like... It's a very personal story. I think it hit me way harder than I anticipated when it's when it's you know hit the landing. Mm -hmm. And it really it really kind of reshaped my personal relationship with a certain type of grief that I had from from the past. I don't want to spoil, you know, the the contents of the the show. Oh, for that's you. like really um, that makes me want to watch even more. <laughs> I didn't realize it, like, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but that, that sounds really good. <laughs> thank you. And Vanessa, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the follow. Uh, let me, let me follow you guys back. I think I don't follow you here yet. Yeah, All the I headers like are so we pretty. Never, <laughs> we haven't been on here in a million years. <laughs> Well, the next time you are, I'll be notified and I will be there. Yay! So, you we already talked about the, the podcast, which I assume is, you know, the project you're currently working on, probably like finishing up. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is the project you've been the most proud of that can be, you know, overall or can be a recent, recent thing? Uh, so I would definitely say the animated music video, uh, the music video for I'm a Snake by Opal Voss. Let me link uh, that again, please. One second. Cool. I just want to put that, that up again. Because for some reason it has unpinned itself. Yeah, here. When I was when I saw that, I was just like completely um wow, it's like I, mm -hmm. you know, the the production value is just so high. Thank you. Yeah, um I don't know. This was just an insane amount of work. There was just so much I did for it, like just making the backgrounds in 3D, like doing all the textures for those and adding all the details and little props in there took um, probably like a year and a half alone. But that was also because um, I was kind of learning um, Blender and just 3D in general as I went. So I would like complete a whole scene and then move on to the next one. And by the time I was finished with the next scene, I just my skills just got so much better that I would need to like go back and redo what I did before. Um, so that was part of why it took so long was just um, my skill level changing and me being like no longer happy with the things I did early on. So just having to redo things and revisit things a lot. Um, but also just the 2D animation part was insanely challenging. Um, and it took me a long time to get to the point where it didn't feel like um, so difficult <laughs> that I felt like I could barely do it. But I finally reached the point <laughs> um, near the end where I felt like decent about animating. And it was just, it was really, really hard. 
but also I learned I've never learned more from a project and I'm really happy with what how it came out and I'm glad I stuck with it and made something I feel good about because I really wanted to like give up a lot of the time I can imagine because that's also such a long time and it's almost kind of like a ship of TCS kind of thing where you know you keep ripping out the old floorboards and like redoing them and then at some point you might think you know is this, so, is this still the same project I started or is this like morphing into into something else but I think it turned out amazing I think Thank that's you. like like I can tell how much effort and like dedication went into making this real and I think it's truly amazing that it was able to be released and the final the final version is just beautiful I can you know implore you guys to to please check it out it's pinned uh it's pinned there in the in the comment thank you yeah. so I have one last question for you and I think then our our little podcast episode will draw to its close do the do the people in your life know and support your your passions? Yeah, um, definitely. Like everyone who is closest to me, like all of my closest friends are actually directly involved in writing me Utopia. Um, like my girlfriend is like a co-founder, and then every other my other friends are like writers, voice actors. Um, writers and voice voice actors on the podcast. Um, so yeah, they definitely support what I do because um, I don't know, they're creative themselves and also they're directly involved in the project. Um, and yeah, I, def I feel like I always have someone uh, who's excited about what I'm doing. And I think that is also like a big motivator. So I'm... I'm glad you have that support system, you know. I, I'm glad you have people that lift you up and, you know, enjoy your work. It's always nicer to enjoy it together with someone else. And with, like, all your collaborators, that that probably also means you guys have a very strong bond, right, for, long, for like, working on this for such a long time. Yeah, we hang out together all the time. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. It's very, very nice. Well, Kate, thank you for being here. It was lovely to meet you. I feel like... I don't know. I feel like... Some of the things you, you said really made me think about my own creative journey. And like the difficulties I faced. Like the, the copying thing. I definitely feel... Where it's like such a shunned thing in like the art world. But for learning purposes, it really shouldn't matter. And yeah. just in general, it was so nice to, to meet you and learn more about Ready Made Utopia. And I'm so excited for the things to come. The podcast. Can you... Is, is there a release date already? Or is it not decided yet? Um, It's coming out in October. I honestly forget what day exactly. If Vanessa is here, she can say it in the chat. I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> October 2nd! But, oh, oh my October God. 2nd. That's what I thought. That's what I was going to say, but that's so soon. It was about to say it's in like eight days, eight or nine days, most likely. Wow. And it's the Experience Corporation, right? Yeah. Um, and it's honestly so good. It's so fun to listen to. Um, definitely check it out. <laughs> Oh, and as you guys have uh, heard earlier, if you sus uh, if you subscribe to them now, you can see like all the little teaser teaser material already. Uh, if possible, could you maybe uh, send me a link to the podcast, just like one yeah. of them, so I can post it in the chat? Yeah, there's like um, I'm pulling it up right now. Mm -hmm. It's just that I have I have said it in like my stream that only I can post links just so we can avoid spamming behavior and just in general disruptive behavior. So 
Oh, yeah, thank I you. sent the link over. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. That's completely perfect. Here. Please, 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 please check it out. Oh, I see the I see the teaser, the teaser things. Oh, and the album cover looks so nice. Oh, I'm so Thank excited. You. Yeah, I'm really happy with how the art came out. I was a little nervous, but I like what it looks like. <laughs> It reminds me of like an older game manual, especially with like how yellowed it is, like the 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 quote unquote the paper. Yeah, I I was really inspired by like airplane safety <gasps> manuals. Oh my god, yeah, I can totally see that. Oh, I like that. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was really nice. Thank you, Kate. I know I always meander so much, but I'm I'm glad you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. Yeah, definitely. And I hope you guys will check out Ready Made Utopia and the Experience Corporation. And I hope I see you guys on the next episode. Not episode, the next stream. The the next episode will be next month. I think I'll uh, I'll use the time to recover a little bit and just organize you know, things a little bit so, so streams can go back on schedule. But I'll see you guys on Monday and I'm quite excited for that. So let's find a nice person to raid and I'll, I'll send you guys off to. And I think I know who I'm sending you to. I think a good friend of mine has just started a special event stream. Their name is Mieleta or Mieleta. I'm sorry, I'm so bad with like, <laughs> with reading words, but they're a cute vampire. They're very cute. I'm gonna send you to them. Yeah, thank you for being here, Arine. Thank you. I appreciate it. You guys are so nice. You're a great audience. Thank you for being here and talking to us. And I'm gonna see you on Monday. Oh, yeah, Nikshi. Yeah, we're about to end. Oh, no. But thank you for saying hi to us. Thank you. All right, guys. Support my friend. Be nice to them, you know. And yeah, you know, thanks, everyone. Like, for thank me, you. organizing these things um, can be sometimes a little bit difficult because, you know, planning ahead of, like, a different person always requires like you know like legwork and like flexibility and then you know real life can still happen you know like with my with my stomach this week i was very scared that i wouldn't be able to do it today but you know when things work out it's always such a beautiful experience like i wouldn't want to miss it ever today's a good example for that all righty i'm gonna let you go now goodbye guys see you on monday <laughs> Goodbye! And stream!